Uh, dear Sangha, so now we can hear the sound about to go back to ourselves and enjoy our being, enjoy our breathing. And if you have a question, please come up here and take turn to sit on the chair. And we um, would like to invite the teen, come up, the young adult first and then adult. Dear Thai, dear Sangha, I'm not a teen. <laughs> um, I've been asked to teach mindfulness to a big international pharmaceutical company. And I feel a little conflict. Um, Thai, three years ago, was talking about true mindfulness and how we can communicate mindfulness honestly. And and so to do justice to the practice of mindfulness in a context that's not always uh, working in the best interests of the environment or humanity, uh, I'm confused. So any advice would be very welcome. Dear respected Thai, dear community, dear sister, I know that um, when we hear about pharmaceutical companies, um, at least for me, my perspective is always, wow, these guys are making a lot of money. They are actually creating the problem, then they give a solution, and they make the money off that. In a way, some probably practice like that. But we can also look at it in a different perspective. Medicines itself is also created to help people. So it's not all bad, but it's not all good either. It's our job, our role. When we live in a society, in a community, when we become in touch with such a community like that, then what we want to do is to give our best to help guide them on an ethical way of practicing, an ethical way of living and earning their money. So it's not always they are the bad guys. they are always good people living in that company and doing their best to raise their family, 
to do the right thing. And these are the seed that we can watch in them when we come and be in contact with them. In your case, to teach them mindfulness. In mindfulness, it's not just the awareness of what we're doing at the present moment, but it's also the awareness of what we're doing to our environment, to the people around us. So when we teach our mindfulness, we can also teach the mindfulness of the five mindfulness trainings. This will help to touch this wholesome seeds in them. And that itself will slowly be water and will blossom. And when they have to make these decisions, should I make this medicine to make more profit for my company, add things into it that are not needed, those wholesome seeds that have been watered by you will help them to guide them to a better direction and they themselves will make the right decision. And this is the best thing we can do. So for me, I hope while you're teaching mindfulness trainings to them, you also put in the my five mindfulness trainings. When we teach mindfulness, we have to practice mindfulness. And we teach from our experience, not from the knowledge. And when you have the experience, you have more um, confident to teach them, to continue to do it. So you have to go through every difficulty you have in your company and in your daily life. So mindfulness you practice in the daily life have to uh, deal with the joy, happiness, peace, and suffering and difficulty. How you create joy for yourself, how you transform your suffering and difficulty. It's like in our Sangha, uh, we have some uh, challenging. For example, when we have the meeting for the important event, and there are many ideas come up, and we have to make the decision in the harmony. And how? So everyone has to let go the idea in order that we can go to the decision in harmony. So we don't, we don't attach to our idea because when we attach to our idea, we suffer a lot. So we have to learn the way to let go of our idea. And sometimes we think that our idea is the best and we want to attach it. But we have to know that the harmony in the community is the most important thing. So we, let, we have to let go our idea in order that we can go to the harmony in the, in the community. And with the harmony, we can do a lot of things. So we learn from our experience. And how we deal with the suffering and difficulty when we have, when we have the problem with your, like, your colleague, for example, in my situation, when I had a difficulty with my sister, how I deal with that. So I had to practice to calm down myself, to, come, to transform my anger, and to keep the, the love on. So whatever happened, I would like to get the communication. I want to keep the good relationship. I want to keep the love on. And sometimes I just go back to myself and take care of my emotion. And when I feel that I calm down, I am peaceful and happy and joy, I can accept my sister easily. So I made the situation change. So it is my experience. And the more we practice, the more experience we have in the daily life. And because we had the experience, so it is why we had the we, we feel confident when we guide people or when we teach mindfulness to other people. Because everyone, we are human, and even we practice mindfulness, but still anger, jealousy, hatred, sadness, suffering, and difficulty still in us. And as they used to say that happiness and suffering, are, they inter are. And we don't think that if we practice mindfulness so we don't have any suffering or difficulty, 
or we don't have the anger, or we don't have the jealousy. We have all. And because we have all and we practice, so it is why we have the experience to share to other people. Imagine that if we don't have certain things, how can we have the experience to share with people? And if we don't have the suffering, so we don't feel the, lead, the relationship between ourselves and other people. Because did it your stuff? I don't know. So how can we guide the people? And we have to go through all our suffering and difficulty. And we have to be stay with it. We don't run away from our suffering and difficulty. And I know that we stay with our suffering and difficulty is much more difficult than we run away from them. But if we run away from them, we also create the habit energy. We always run from our we, we run away from our suffering and difficulty. But when we stay with the suffering and difficulty, sometimes it's very painful, but it's a process of healing. We heal our relationship, we heal our communication, and we, have, we offer ourselves and other people the opportunity to heal themselves also. Offer ourselves and offer other people the opportunity to begin anew. So when we have the experience, we feel more joyful, more happy, and uh, more at ease when we teach the mindfulness. And we open our soul. Of course, we had some uh, witness. We had some mistake. And we are not proud that we practice for a long time already. Why we still angry with other people? Why we still suffer with it? Sometimes because of the proud, we don't dare to say that we're suffering. Or we don't dare to say that we're angry. But we are human. When we're angry, we accept that we are angry. When we suffer, we accept that we are suffering. So whatever happens in ourselves, we accept them as they are. They're nothing to be proud. It is just the process of transform, transformation. It is a process of nourish ourselves and other people. And when you have the experience by yourself, you can help a lot of people. So I hope that you can go through uh, every difficult moment, every uh, suffering moment, and then you have more confidence in your career. Thank you so much for your listening. Maybe we take a, a written question. It's okay. So, uh, there's two questions. One is, uh, we are learning that many young people, teenagers and those who are in their 20s, are choosing to end their lives. What can we do to help their families, their friends, loved ones and loved ones cope with the great sadness that follows. Their grieving is so deep. How can we help? And the second question is, how can I find the Buddha nature in myself? Dear Thai, dear friends, I, I think I can um, share a little bit my experience. Um, because I was in that case. Um, because I didn't have a meaning uh, for my life when I was younger. 
and um, I was searching. I study uh, philosophy at university, so I was looking for wisdom somewhere. <laughs> and I was looking for happiness. Um, but somehow I couldn't um, find it and touch it in me. <clears throat> so um, I start to uh, have a um, habit um, uh, at, um, when I was a, a teen, a habit of mind um, with a lot of um, suffering and uh, complexes and and simply I didn't love myself. Wow. <laughs> um, and I think this is is not um, it's not a mystery, I think, but uh, it's very basic. But this is probably why um, people have depression or want to kill themselves because they cannot touch the love in themselves, and they are looking somewhere in other people, but is not fulfilling and it will never be fulfilling and sometimes they lose hope so luckily we have uh, uh, many centers, centers in the world uh, in the Plum Village tradition <laughs> so you can uh, um, encourage them to come here or in US or in Germany and then maybe something will happen, like for me. Um, I, earlier I said that I uh, fell in love with a Sangha. It means that I could um, strongly touch something that I couldn't find outside. A sense of love, of peace, everybody was smiling and I really fell at home. And then I had to do my own process, my whole healing, um, healing process and transform my suffering because it has been there for maybe more than 10 years, maybe 15 years, or maybe even younger. <laughs> um, and then the, the first thing that I um, acknowledge is I don't love myself. I didn't love, now it's okay. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't sit there. <laughs> um, so I had to accept myself as I was, as I am. And I also have to somehow embrace all the emotions that I have had and I have to embrace my parents also in me. I think that was really a part of the process. Um, and also accept that I have some beauty um, because we sometimes, so one thing when I was in that situation, uh, when I was a teen and young adult, everybody around me tried to help me, but there was, I couldn't get it. <laughs> um, so it's also very uh, a lot of frustration for the family and the friends who try to help uh, people uh, who are really depressed and, and uh, want to kill themselves, for example, because we don't know what to do. Um, so Now that you are here um, in Plum Village, you maybe come for the first time and you know such a place exists. Maybe this is one, one door, one way to invite them to come and maybe sit uh, with them and uh, uh, try to ask them, what do you want to do? What, what would you like to do? 
just open, very open question. And because also maybe in the society we have like a, um, a standard, like a, a job, a family, and, and uh, if your aspiration is not uh, following the majority, then you, you, you don't know where to go, you, you kind of lost. But if the family, if the friends, or if the psychotherapist is um, looking together with the person, okay, what, what would you like to do? Do you want to go somewhere to travel? Do you want to go, you know, to do something that maybe they don't think about it? I never thought I would be <laughs> ending a, a monastic. <laughs> So um, um, maybe to explore more with, with them, it's, um, it's a way to uh, be present for them and not, uh, not pushing, not expecting, um, be patient again, and also looking at also ourselves, how can we relate to a person that we really want to help, but we, we feel powerless? Um, and then uh, that's where the Buddha nature is. Uh, I, I was thinking uh, the two questions can come together. Um, if we are in a situation of the helper, then I think we should um, bring a lot of uh, love and compassion and understanding in, in ourself. And this is our Buddha nature, to be able to love unconditionally, to have peace, whether we, we want them to, to change, but we just keep peace. And, um, and then if there is something in us changing, maybe that will also have an impact uh, with that person that we are trying to help. Because I don't think that we can tell him or her, oh, you know, you have this quality and this quality, they, they cannot see, they, they, they are too um, stuck in their suffering. Is, uh, is too much um, for most of them. And one element that I learned to develop is the joy. Um, to be joyful is uh, really, an, uh, for me, it's uh, an art. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was really difficult at the beginning. So um, maybe this is also another um, um, suggestion. Uh, maybe for you as a helper to have joy inside and see how can you water the seed of joy little by little, not too much. <laughs> Very skillfully, you really have to be skillful. Uh, and uh, letting the process happening and giving the time, but always be present for, for them. Um, and I'm very grateful my parents were always here for me. And they, yeah, they supported me and um, and now I support them. <laughs> so I don't know if uh, this is enough, but this is all I have to share for now. Thank you. Mm, dear Thai, dear friends, so also part of the question is, how can we help the family after the fact? Because this already happened, and now the family is in great pain. How can we help? 
So for me, I can see the first thing is that all those family members will have a great guilty feeling. Have I done enough to help this person? What did I did not do? Did I do something wrong? And all of these feelings, this guilty feeling, really, really hard for the person to overcome. That's why if you want to help them, you yourself have to practice very, very solid. And the best way to help them, in my perspective, is to hold their hand and take a walk with them. Taking a walk, even though they don't know anything about walking meditation, they never be in touch with Plum Village practice, it's okay. You have. You are able to practice walking meditation. So when you take their hand and walk, you do walking meditation. You send all your love to them and touch their heart. But when they do walking meditation, their mind will stop thinking. It will help. Holding their hand, that feeling of the hand being held by your hand also help. So this is the first step to help relieve the immediate problem, but it doesn't solve the problem. You have to help them to not thinking about the wrong negative part of the person who has passed away. Because as they're thinking of, have I done anything? They have done everything I could. They will always think about, this person is in this problem, having that problem. Help them think in a different perspective. Help them remember the beauty in that person who has passed away. Help them remember all the joy they have with that person, the good quality of that person. Instead of thinking of the negative qualities that push that person to that very end, help them think of the beauty. And then help them cherish that beauty. That is what made the person continue. It's not life and death. It's how beautiful that person lived while that person was still there. And that beauty will continue in their heart. So you help them to recognize that, help them to cherish that. And slowly, that will help them to alleviate that guilty feeling that it was their fault, they did not do enough. So if you can practice solidly and be there for them, that will help them a lot. And it's through your own practice, your own solidity, your love, that will care for them. So I hope that the hope answered part of that question. Thank you, dear Sangha. So, um, during the Dharma sharing, I have moments where I uh, practice mindf being mindful, listening, and uh, noticing the breath, and then still I feel really tired. And I'm wondering if you have been able to transform that in yourself, or is that still there? And what do you do? Maybe some of us are listening to the Q&A and we feel a little bit tired. <laughs> so we can understand. I'd like to look at my tiredness. Bring 
mindfulness to being tired. So I just am aware that maybe my head feels a bit heavy, uh, my body, my eyes are droopy, and so I play with it like that. I just, but I, I maintain that awareness. It's very, very subtle, but it makes a huge difference. You don't just let yourself be taken away by the tiredness. Instead, you just maintain this very light, very present awareness of the tiredness. How does it feel in your body? Because there's many kinds of tiredness, <laughs> like many species. Sometimes it comes from here, sometimes, you know, when we have a big meal, it comes from down here, and the blood from our head gets pulled down, and then we... <laughs> you know, when we were novices, many of us, we fall asleep during sitting meditation. It's very fun. Sometimes a brother falls over like this, That happened to me, right in front of me. My brother. <laughs> that same brother, he swore that he could, uh, even though many times when he was listening to Thai's Dhamma talk, sorry, um, <laughs> and many brothers poke him from behind because he, he, he fell over, but he, 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 he swore that he could recite exactly what Thai was just saying before he, <laughs> he started to fall over. He said, I'm not falling asleep. I'm aware of what Tai is saying. <laughs> so we may have many joyful things like that. And we have even some elder sisters, and they admit that they have a lot of problems falling asleep during sitting meditation. <laughs> they don't know why. It just happens like that. And then they're just sitting there, and so, boop. <laughs> and so the first thing is just to be compassionate to ourselves, that we are human and we, ha we, we get tired. And that tiredness is, is, a, is a message from our body. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an important message. Yeah. Everything our body is feeling and doing is a, is a message. So if, if we just try to ignore it, then we, we just create more suffering. Yeah. So that's the first thing, is just to fully accept the tiredness that's there and recognize it as tiredness um, and, and embrace it with the energy of mindfulness. So I, like I shared before, I, for me it's a kind of light mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's like when we are learning to ride a bicycle, we start with the training wheels so we don't fall over because we don't know how to balance yet the bike. We don't know what speed we need to go in order to keep the bike balanced. So here, we slow down in Plum Village to help us to kind of like training wheels. It doesn't mean that mindfulness is slow. A lot of people think mindful. Oh, he's eating so mindfully. <laughs> when we... I think uh, sometimes amongst the brothers, when we see somebody eating like that, we're like, uh oh. <laughs> we have to be careful. <laughs> Usually it means there's going to be an explosion because they have the wrong idea about mindfulness. It's okay to be slow when we start. But I remember in the formal lunch, when I, wa I would watch Thai, because we would eat with Thai every week in the formal lunch. And I, sometimes I was on the side and I could look at Thai. And I saw Thai choose very quickly. <laughs> but Tai chews his food at least 30 times, every time, maybe 40 times, but he, 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 not, he doesn't... <laughs> so that can be a, you know, we, we can mistake and, and we spend our whole life just with keeping the training wheels on. And we don't ever remove them. And so part of it is we slow down here so we can come back to our breath. We're changing our habit energies, so it's, help, it's helpful to start slowly. But then, as we become more skillful at being mindful, we can use it in all kinds of situations, like when we're falling asleep. So I, I like to do that many times. I like to really be aware. What is this falling asleep? What happens? 
and just shine that light of mindfulness. You can do it in a total relaxation. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's very interesting because you see that um, you, you become more... Uh, for me, the situation of being tired helps me to understand more clearly what is mindfulness? What is attention? Because uh, at some point, right, we, we, we do fall asleep. At some point we... So, it, so how long can you maintain? And with how little energy, how, how lightly can you maintain that awareness of your body? It's, it's very fun to do that because you, you learn that Sometimes what we call attention and what we call mindfulness is a lot of wasted energy. Mindfulness requires energy. It's not just there with there's some energy, but a lot of it, I think, is wasted energy because we're not really getting really in there. It's exactly what is that attention, what is that mindfulness. And personally, I found that that situation of becoming tired is how I, I, I refine my mindfulness. So it, it becomes more... Um, Precise, and I see that it only takes a very light touch, but it requires that touch. It really, the, the something it requires. So it, we're doing something. We're not just letting ourselves go into to sleep. And then you see all kinds of wonderful things. <laughs> There's a whole cosmos in our body. You don't need to look at the stars. There's all kinds of feelings, emotions. It's never boring. It's never boring. I never get bored. So I'm always finding new things. Um, yeah, so anyway, that's how I practice with tiredness. So maybe just try it out. There's many ways to answer your question, but I think, you know, not to confuse you too much, just maybe try that out and see how it works. Okay? Yeah. feel a bit nervous so um, there are 65 million people displaced or refugees in the world right now I, the world worst refugee crisis the world has ever seen we see the rise of right wing extremism extremism here, there. I know that history sees patterns. It comes in cycles. So in some ways, fate takes hold of history. So what we're seeing now is just how it is. Does that make sense? So it goes to the right, goes to the left. And a lot of what appeals to me about um, the teaching series, the engagement, engage Buddhism, Buddhism. But sometimes I feel very despondent that I can't make a difference because I, I know how history works. And sometimes I feel extreme anger. Um, extreme. I feel really, really angry at the trauma, at the indifference, and at, I think the vilification of people who are running away from war and violence. I feel very angry. But yet, usually, I feel apathetic. And I, what difference can I make? Um, so my question is, bearing in mind that history goes like this, what difference do we make? I just 
someone to, if, if I can, if I may, there's a, another question which is very related. If, I think. Uh, how do I, how do I deal with or protect myself from the prevalent racism that exists in the West, be it conscious or subconscious? My, my question really is, because history is so clear in the, with the cycles, that things are, seem to go from one extreme to another, is, it's, what difference do we make if, if that's how it is? It, we do see these very similar cycles historically. Is that clear? And so I understand the impact of what we try to do here. Um, but in the very big scheme of things, I feel sometimes it's futile and I feel, yeah, maybe that's just me, but that's how I feel. Um, and particularly in relation to what's going on now, I see as people who survived World War II are dying, we see the rise of fascism again, for example. So this is what, so my question is, what difference do we make in relation, if we bear that in mind? Is that clear? Thank you. Dear Thai, dear friends, mm. I will answer a little bit and then I will let my brothers and sister add if they, if they have something to add. Mm. I'm also very uh, touched and moved by everything that is happening now. And um, In your sharing, before uh, formulating your question, you mentioned anger. So maybe I will go in that uh, area. Um, in terms of uh, engaged Buddhism, um, I think we have a different level and we cannot all do um, the same and it's, uh, it's lucky because maybe some of us as for example monastic we are here and to host um, a big retreat like that and this is our main purpose and we know that we are helping a lot of people and then you go out again and you will spread the practice in your own environment and then maybe some of you will make a big um, a step and change um, and decide to go in a place of war to help um, but we cannot all go there um, and I think that uh, we have to be realistic um, and I think also with the idea of the history is uh, coming again and again. Um, it shouldn't be an excuse not to feel anything and it's like, okay, well, whatever, it's like that. So we... Um, um, for my own practice, I recently, very recently, a few days ago, I choose to um, choose some. Um, we don't have TV here. We don't. Okay, so we, some of us have uh, access to internet. So sometimes we can uh, know what is happening in the world, but we don't um, allow the seed of 
despair and anger and sadness being watered every day and every day by the news. <coughs> but um, in a 14 mindfulness training, we are asked to um, um, stay in touch with those who are suffering. So recently I chose uh, some pictures on, on internet um, from um, Alep, Aleppo uh, in Syria. And I chose um, a man with his two young boys in the middle of ruins. And um, I'm also um, in touch with the, uh, some of the country of Africa, uh, that we will have a million of, probably a million of people dying from, uh, how do you say? Hunger. Hunger, yeah, the famine. And I also choose some pictures. And um, my idea is I will uh, print them and I will uh, um, get, uh, stay with them, with my heart. I cannot go there, or I could, but <laughs> that's not my choice. My choice is to uh, stay here and to stay in contact with them and bring all the love that I can, all the peace that I can, even though, um, right, even right now, I'm a little bit sad <laughs> and the tears are coming. Uh, so even though there is sadness or there is um, what is going to happen or why or this kind of question. <coughs> But knowing that I'm not um, in the, um, at the top of the UN or like uh, making big decision, or uh, that's my, my contribution. Uh, I choose to contribute like that. And um, also one of my practice is um, gratitude. Um, I. Um, it's a very specific, so you can choose to do it in another way. But um, and to not uh, fall into despair or uh, anger or sadness, um, I try to uh, be grateful for what, what I have now. Um, the, li the life I am living now, and I am uh, in a country that is not in war, etc. And I don't allow the, my mind to, um, to be negative because it's not helpful for me and for them. So when I hold my uh, uh, bowl uh, of food and then I bring in mind all these people um, in Syria or that are in war and uh, running um, running for the life and also for those who may die of hunger and even though there is a little bit of sadness but the gratitude for the condition that I have is greater than the sadness and then I, I send this positive energy to them so I don't know it's I don't know if it's going to change anything, but at least I feel at peace and I don't have much uh, sadness or uh, anger in me. And that's for me the most important because even if we go there, but we have a lot of anger or if we, that's not helpful. Yeah, so this is my contribution. Dear Sangha, dear friend, um, I also have a friend who um, loved to help the orphans. And she used to go to Vietnam all the time. And every year she come and she uh, help play and financially help the uh, orphanage center. But she's very despair. Every time she come back, no joy. Because she told me, I came and the next year I come back there's like 20 more orphans. 
it keep on growing and growing. I, I, there's nothing I can do. I don't think I'm helping anything. Because all the young uh, women now, mm, they just decide not to raise the child and just drop off the orphanage. But then she also look at a different light. It's not that she can, she, she can never solve the orphanage problem. But when she's there and taking care of one child, that means a different life for that child. It means everything. That child was grown up being thrown away by his or her parents. Only no hatreds. Never no love. So when she's there and be with that child, and care for that child and love that child, she gave that child something different. And when that child grew up, he or she is not in despair or hate the world and want to do harm to all those that want to do harm, throw him or her away. But that child learned the lesson of love, of caring for others. Caring for the other orphanage children who is there. Caring for those that he or she may not even know because he or she have learned love from my friend who has shown it. So it's like a butterfly effect. You cannot solve the problem of the world. But one small problem, one small child, one small thing you can do, and that itself ripples to many, many others. So it's not like you're not making a difference. You are making a difference. And the way you live your life, it makes a big difference to any of those who is able to be around you. So this is the same for the racism. Yeah, you can never say that I will be able to solve all the racism. But if you learn how to love, that energy is one more unit of energy of love and the energy of discrimination and hate go one less. It makes a difference, but we cannot see it. We cannot measure it, but I know you can feel it when you do it. When you do things out of love and caring, it's right there in your heart. You have it, all of us. We all have that energy of compassion and love, and we can share it, and we can generate ourselves little by little with our own practice. And that itself make a difference in the world. So that's a little bit of uh, my additions to the answers. I hope that helped. more. <laughs> Your question has um, made me remember the story of Thay, our teacher, and Sister Kiang Kong, who helped the refugee. When in Vietnam, there were a lot of war, and the people want to get abroad to, to leave, because at that moment, it's too difficult. And Sister Kiang Kong said, Right there, <laughs> she is a bodhisattva who does, who have done a lot of things like that, and she also came to the war area in Vietnam to help the people, and many many things. And during the time when they helped the people, the both people, and one day they was not allowed to continue and they was asked to leave the Singapore in 24 hours. And at that moment, they feel disappointed. And he didn't know what to do, because he really wanted to help people. And at that moment, he did work in meditation to calm down himself and to um, get peace. And after that, he feel more peaceful and he know what to, how to solve the problem. So if we would like to help people, to help the 
community or to help the uh, country, we have to base on our peace, our inner peace. When we are not so peaceful, we cannot help. Even we had the ruling to help, but willingness is not enough. We have to train ourselves. And by ourselves alone, we cannot help much, we cannot do much, but if we do it as a community, we would do a lot. So imagine that if we come here and we don't have the community of the monastic, so we also cannot help many people like this. And thanks to the community, we have a lot. Even here is different, a little bit different out there. But we have to train ourselves to do in the as a community. And they, our teacher, you to say that if they alone, they cannot help much. But thanks to the community, it will bring a lot of benefit for other people. So maybe you can create a group or a community around you who have the same uh, willingness to help people and to do. Because by yourself, you cannot do much thing. But first of all, you have to transform your anger and disappointment. Because the seed of anger and the seed of disappoint still in our soul. I think that you are not only anger with this situation, but maybe something happened that you don't like. You also can get angry easily, right? So you have to always go back to your anger to see, to look deeply into your root and to calm down yourself. And it is the same with the disappointment when you had the uh, disappointment come up, you have to go back to yourself and don't make yourself become the victim of the situation. Because when you become your victim, you cannot do anything. So everything has to come from yourself. From, uh, it's come from your peace and peace is the, your foundation. So your question also relates to the, the question someone write on the sheet, so I would like to read it to answer at the same. In Plum Village, we practice being and not doing or thinking. So how do free will or effort come into picture? Or do we just allow things to unfold and manifest naturally, although we may not like the present circumstance? And the second question. Is it considered selfish if we just want to make ourselves free and happy without causing harm to others, instead of making others happy? When we are joyful, when we are happy, we do a lot because we have more energy. When we suffer, we don't do much thing. We feel exhausted. We feel overwhelmed by suffering and difficulty. So first of all, we have to take good care of ourselves. We take good care of ourselves in order that we can take good care of other people. And I, I, as I shared earlier, that we have to share, we have to teach other people by our own experience. If we don't have the experience, we cannot help people. So practice to nourish ourselves in order that we can have the experience to help other people. It's not kind of selfish. But we want to make our capacity bigger and bigger day by day. Like when we come to someone and ask for help, and if they are happy and joyful, they will help you. But if they are not, help, they are not joyful and happy, they don't want to help you, right? So it's why to nourish ourselves is very important. In Buddhism, there are two kinds of thinking, wrong thinking and right thinking. Wrong thinking brings us suffering and difficulty. Right thinking brings us a lot of joy and happiness. So there's no problem with the thinking. If you think in the positive way, it's good, it will bring you a lot of joy and happiness, so just keep thinking. But because majority of our thinking is wrong thinking, a lot of our thinking is 
negative thinking and it causes a lot of suffering and difficulty. So it is why we have to train ourselves stop thinking. But if you think that you, you had the right thinking, just continue to do it. And also at the beginning of practice, we think a lot. Even something is not so important, but keep thinking, and thinking becomes our habit energy. And maybe the same thing, but yet you just think and think and think and think many, many times, and it's overwhelm you, and you don't have enough space to enjoy. So it is why we train ourselves to stop thinking. And we had, when we had the capacity to stop thinking, we would do a lot. Stop thinking in order that we are more peaceful. And when we are peaceful, the inside comes up naturally. Like our mind is like the pond. When the, clear, the water is clear and still, you will see clearly what is in the pond. But when we steer up, Still, we cannot see anything. So it is the same with the wisdom. If you keep the mind calm, if you keep the mind quiet and still, you see things clearly. So it is the way we train ourselves. So either we like the present situation or not. Sometimes there's something happened that made ourselves like it, and sometimes made ourselves don't like it. So we have to observe our mind, how we react with that situation. And we observe our mind and calm down our mind if we react quickly. Uh, take time to settle down, take time to calm down our soul. And slowly, slowly, the inside will come up and show you the way. And don't wait until you can reach out there to help the refugee to be happy. You can be happy right away. Because you are aware that if you are not happy, if you are not so peaceful, you cannot, you cannot help people out there. So I wish you can enjoy the practice happily and joyfully. And find the Sangha, find the community to work with you. Thank you. Next question. So maybe this is the last question. Hi, dear Sangha, dear brothers and sisters. Uh, in the beginning of my uh, practice, right, I, I am in the beginning, but more in the beginning of my practice, uh, it was my impression that my practice helped my family life only. But after that, I found out that also my family life helped my practice, that I practice better when I am in contact with my family. Uh, I believe that's the same in the Sangha. But still, there are conflicts that arise when we are tired or because of lack of time or lack of money or excess of responsibilities. or any other cause. Uh, what I would like to ask is ways to train 
to be a good husband and a good father, bringing joy to my family and keeping compassion alive in myself, even in difficult moments. Thank you. First, I just would like to thank you for the beautiful question. I wish that all fathers can ask a question like this. <laughs> that is already a beautiful gift that you ask that question. Yeah. I think just reflecting on that question may be already enough of an answer. <laughs> because there's no one way to do those things. Right? It's each situation. And uh, if I'm honest, as a monk, uh, my family is uh, the Sangha. I have my blood family, but I live with my Sangha. And, you know, if I'm honest, uh, I, I always wish uh, that I can make my brothers and sisters happy and they can feel joyful. But I, I often make them suffer also. <laughs> And uh, usually that happens because uh, I have an idea about uh, the community which I love so dearly. And, and I think that if, I, if we don't do that thing like that, that the Sangha will be in danger, that there will be more suffering. And so I learned that that's the seed of the Father in me, wanting to protect, wanting to protect the Sangha, protect my family. And uh, when I look more deeply, I see there's an anxiety, there, a worry, that someone will get hurt, that um, the Sangha will split, um, that we will um, yeah, not continue to, to share this, this beautiful path with many people like we, we are doing now. So these kind of fears, when I look deeply, I see that there are fears like that in me. And because I haven't taken care of that fear in myself, I actually make my brothers and sisters suffer. <laughs> you see, in my action to protect, to try to, to help, then I actually create more suffering. <laughs> so that is, I think, that, that seed of the Father in us. And when I look deeply, I see that's not only in myself. I, take re I practice to take responsibility for, for my actions, but I see that also that is in my father <laughs> and in my grandfather and his you know, going back, not only in my father, but also in my mother, <laughs> because uh, that is how we, as, uh, as homo sapiens, that is how we have evolved you know, to, to, to be where we are today. And, uh, you know, we can extend that to how we have um, created better and better conditions, supposedly better conditions for us to live today, and at the same time harming the mineral life on our planet, not being aware of how that then affects the atmosphere and then affects our own lives. So we have to take a holistic view. <laughs> when there's a that little bit of fear that comes from protecting, we have to be vigilant. That's what I've learned. I have to be right away, when that fear arises, say that there's a danger. Because based on that fear and my desire to protect, I can do da damage. This is where the root of war, it's, it's, it's in that little, that fear that unknown, that fear of the unknown, and we, you know, 
that deeper instinctual part of our brain takes over and we 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 justify our anger we justify our sadness and and we create war and suffering so i learned that i have to take care of that energy first that is how i can best protect everyone if i'm taking care of that then that inspires my wife or my partner it inspires my children because they have someone close to them that is learning how to take care of that fear of that anxiety and that is the greatest gift that is a much greater gift than just being the protector you know trying to make decisions and enforce those decisions over everyone then they cannot cultivate their own wisdom you're giving them the through your own practice the capacity to have insight so they can see for themselves and if there's a gift that i feel i received from my parents it is the importance of our mind and taking care of our mind and really questioning what is the, like we already had what is the meaning of life <laughs> leaving them the space to do that for themselves of course you provide the good environment but you have to take care of your own practice so don't ever think that your own practice is a selfish action that is a deep protection the deepest and the most profound it, it creates an energy around you which you feel here in plum village if if there were not that energy i would feel worried all the time i see the children climbing a tree or <laughs> running off without any parents and that is the way in most places in the world the children uh, the parents are anxious where is my child but here in plum village because we feel this energy this collective energy of mindfulness we create a invisible protective body that is protecting the family and so our contribution is our practice to that collective energy in that way we create a space where joy happiness freedom is possible in every child in our partner so that is a uh, for me the deep practice of being a father <laughs> how we protect it and make our family free and happy <laughs> good luck <laughs> thank you uh, sangha thank you the friends who asked very beautiful question and there are some question is uh, was written on the paper is not um, answer yes so i hope that the dharma talk tomorrow will brother will answer for you that will include in the dharma dharma talk so we will end here with the three sound of the bell and please enjoy your day thank you <laughs>